Technology Libraries and Italian Studies Program. Uh, this event is the expression of uh, the will and effort of a number of people, and I would like to thank uh, uh, the entire Mentoris editorial team, and in particular Christopher Loera and uh, Natalie Nunes, mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, with whom I worked uh, uh, closely to plan the event. And also uh, development librarian Esra uh, Nauer uh, for guidance and support from uh, the onset. And I know that Esra has an important announcement to make uh, at the beginning of the event. So, Esra, please. Thank you, Federico. Um, my name is Astrona Warham, the development librarian here. We're very excited to host this event with the, uh, the Barbera Foundation and the, the whole Mentors project. Um, you're just really quick, you're here at the Center for the American War Letters. I know we have a Civil War historian here, so you may want to come back and see that what space. Can be cooler? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're really excited and honored, and it's a standing room only, so that's wonderful. The, the actually, I'm also here on the behalf of the dean and the associate dean of the libraries. Uh, they could not be here today, but they know that Federico is going to uh, moderate the panel. But the announcement that I have uh, is, and thanks to the Barbera Foundation, that they just donated today the whole collection of 16 books uh, that the Mentors Project have uh, published. And they are all highlight, highlighting uh, Italians and Italian Americans that have contributing, uh, contributed to the Western civilization in many, many aspects. So thank you for the Barbera Foundation. Those are all going to be uh, cataloged and are going to be available in the library catalog for all the students, the researchers, and really the whole world. So thank you so much for that and enjoy the event. Thank you. Before introducing our speakers uh, this evening, I wanted to uh, remind uh, all of you uh, that this is part of a series of events that we run here at Chapman dedicated to Italian culture. And to stay informed about uh, all of our programming, you can uh, subscribe to the Chapman Italian Studies News uh, blog, uh, which can be easily uh, found online. Uh, for example, uh, this uh, coming spring, we will have uh, the fourth uh, Italian Perspective Symposium, uh, this time devoted to the intersection between science and the arts in Italy, uh, with presentations on Michelangelo, Da Vinci, Galilei, and more. And I believe a flyer is uh, uh, making its way around about this uh, spring event. This evening, we have an opportunity to learn about an exciting new editorial project called the Mentoris Project, which consists of a series of novels and biographies about the lives of uh, great Italian and Italian Americans. As its name uh, clearly uh, suggests, Mentoris uh, is Latin for mentor. The central aim of this project is to provide books that will serve as guides for the readers. These books dramatize the lives of great figures and aim to underscore the deeper human principles behind their vicissitudes and work. It is a series that shows Italian and Italian-American culture and heritage uh, from both ancient and modern times, including Marcus Cicero, Leonardo da Vinci, Enrico Fermi, A.P. Giannini, Mother Cabrini, Maria Montessori, and many others. This book series aims to increase awareness of uh, the progress made in many aspects of society uh, that has developed out of the Italian peninsula and found its way uh, to the United States. Many of the discoveries made by Italians uh, have influenced the way uh, we live, the way we think, and the way uh, we enjoy ourselves. Such a mission uh, motivates Grand Ufficiale uh, Robert J. Barbera, uh, the chairman of the Barbera Foundation and the visionary uh, behind the Mentores Project, who has once expressed his hope that the books uh, provide, I'm quoting him, inspiration uh, to achieve greatness in our own lives. So we are all very pleased to have Mr. Barbera uh, with us uh, this evening. His commitment to education and to the well-being of uh, the Italian community and culture is well known and already inspiring in itself. So please, let's have a round of applause for Mr. Barbera. Out of the many 
interesting volumes already published, we selected two which focused on early Italians in the United States, Filippo Massei and uh, Luis Palma di Cesnola. We are fortunate and honored to have with us this evening the authors of both volumes, who will be providing uh, a taste of their volumes and introductions of the two historical figures in question. And I would like uh, to ask uh, the audience to keep any questions uh, for the end of the event, uh, when we're going to have our Q&A uh, session. We will begin uh, with uh, America's Forgotten Founding Father, a novel based on the life of Filippo Massey by Roseanne Welch. A few words on the author. Dr. Roseanne Welch is a writer, producer, and university professor. Other books uh, by her include uh, Why the Monkeys Matter, Teenagers Television and American Pop Culture, and uh, together with Dr. Peg Lanfier, Women in American History, a social, political, and cultural encyclopedia and document collection uh, named uh, to the uh, prestigious 2018 Outstanding References Sources List Award. She's also a writer for drama films such as Beverly Hills uh, 90210, uh, Picket Fences, and uh, Touched by an Angel. She also has uh, a, TED, a TED Talk, which you can find online, uh, titled The Importance of Having a Female Voice in the Room. So please, let's welcome Roseanne Glass. you all for being here. We're very excited because we're going to talk about some people that we found fascinating to research who we had never heard of before. And that made us very depressed because I research American history and my friend Peg, who will go next, is a Civil War historian. And yet we had never heard of these men. And that's fascinating to us and sad, particularly to me because I'm Sicilian American, my grandparents are immigrants from Sicily, and I had never been exposed to many of the people that Mr. Barbera had collected and then had books written about. So today we're going to talk about who's missing in this set of pictures up here. You might recognize that guy on the right. You've seen him before, I'm sure, right? Ah, you probably recognize the guy in the middle. He was the most famous American of his time, right? We recognize this guy. And this is James Madison. You might not recognize him, but we sort of should, OK? <laughs> Who is not in this picture is my guy, Philippe Maze. Philippe Maze lived next door to Thomas Jefferson. He owned the plantation next door. And he is the man who wrote those words. We are used to crediting Thomas Jefferson. I'm not saying Thomas plagiarized, because he didn't. But Filippo and Thomas wrote many pamphlets together that were pro the American Revolution. And in one of the early pamphlets written by Filippo, this phrase appeared for the first time in the United States. When Thomas was busy writing the Declaration of Independence, he recalled this marvelous phrase and reused it because he liked how it sounded. Right? But an Italian-American wrote that, which fascinates me. Um, this was recognized by President John F. Kennedy, our first Catholic president, when he wrote a book about us being a nation of immigrants. And he mentioned Mazze in the book and credited him and the whole concept of how much we need immigrants in American life. So that's how important he was, and yet ignored by everybody, right? So this really made me feel bad. He's only in America because of this stone, right? How is a stove part of politics? Well, let me tell you. He starts off in Italy, and as a young man, he learns to be a doctor, and he moves to Turkey. We don't think about people moving very far back in the day. We think it's a big deal if you've gone from California to Ohio. Why you would do that, I don't know, but I went from Ohio <laughs> to here, so there you go. So this is a man who traveled much in his early life, okay? Then he's going to go from Turkey to London, England, right? Always working, moving forward in his life. While he's in London, he's going to meet Benjamin Franklin because of the stove. Because a duke in Italy has written to Filippo and said, I understand there's this super cool new stove and I'd like you to buy me a couple from my castle. Can you do that for me? And Filippo looked around London and found 20 different versions of the Franklin stove. And he wanted to buy the duke the right one. So he 
got an introduction to Franklin, who was in London, going, hey, by the way, we'd like to start a country. We hope you guys are good about that. <laughs> they became friends, and Franklin got mad, figuring out how many people had ripped off his stove and made different versions of it. So together, they found the right version. They sent it to the Duke. Life was good. Franklin convinced him, you should check out this new country we're starting. Very cool place. You will like it. Please come with me. We'll check it out. So they go to Virginia to visit some very important early Americans. Filippo is supposed to buy land from a different guy in Virginia. But when they show up, they go to dinner at this guy's house. And this guy likes to pick his friends very particularly. He wants to be surrounded by smart dudes. That's his goal in life, right? So while we're at Monticello having dinner, he shows Filippo the place next door, which is a whole plantation needing to be purchased, and wouldn't you rather buy this one than the one you're supposed to go to in Southern Virginia, right? So they walk around, they check out the place, Filippo buys it. This was a quote I loved of Thomas Jefferson. I had been lucky enough to visit Monticello several years ago, and he wanted to build a society to our taste. So he literally got other friends to buy, this is like picking your dorm mates, right? <laughs> but these are gonna be your plantation next door neighbor mates, right? So he requested that Filippo come and Filippo did. So now, here are my other neighbors, okay? I'm gonna go to Ashland Highland and I'm gonna be live next door to James Monroe and next door is Montpelier and that's James Madison. So we're the four dudes having dinner and wine every couple of nights, right? That's quite a group to be among and yet you've never heard of Filippo Mazet who went by Philip back in the day, right? This is a, a plaque there. I didn't make this up, he actually did live there. Right? People recognize that there's lots of records about him at Monticello. He wanted to start wine country in America. He wanted to bring wine to America, so that was his big idea. There is actually still wine made at Monticello in his name. It's not from the grapevines he started because some of those were destroyed in some major snowstorms and whatnot. But he's still remembered there. So while he's living in Virginia, hanging out with all these dudes who are founding fathers, but right now, you know, they're radicals. They're going against their king. They should all be locked up or hung or some bad thing. They should all disappear. And they're still doing this really dangerous thing. And Filippo gets involved because he believes in a free country. He calls himself Furioso, because you have to write, but you have to write in a pseudonym so the English uh, can't arrest you, right? So we're all faking who we are. So he writes all these things in the Virginia Gazette, including all men are created equal. He gets invited to join the Virginia militia, which he does, so dudes are you know, running around taking care of things. And he also gets invited to this event you've seen in a million history classes, the Continental Congress. Had he gone there, you might know him better, although off the top of your head, you can't name all the people who went to the Continental Congress now, can you? But had he gone, we might know him more. He chose not to go because he felt that he knew English as a second language and it would be difficult to follow the verbal debates. He was very good on paper, and he knew that he could write very well, but you know, I mean, I wish I could speak Italian better than I do. I could, certainly couldn't sit in a classroom and understand it, right? So he knew he could do that. So he didn't go. They sent his next door neighbor, Thomas Jefferson, right? There you go. So Jefferson went. While Jefferson's there, they come up with an idea that we need some guys to go back to Europe and get us some help because we're failing on this deal. Right? And so if you would go back to Italy for us and get some money and better yet some guns and some guys who like to shoot guns who will come back with you, that would make us all very happy. So Mose is going to go back home to Italy and he's actually going to travel around Europe getting people to support the American colonies, which is a very dangerous thing, but he's going to do it because he really loves this place. Jefferson, later in Mose's life, said this about him, which I thought was very beautiful. I would like someone to say that about me someday. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> and Filippo said that about himself, which I think is very beautiful. It's not why is Mazze here, but why is Mazze not here? He really, really wanted to be of use to people in his life. And that's what he ran around the world, basically, from being a doctor to becoming a political radical. That's what he did. So he's a little bit known in America. We actually do have a stamp dedicated to him that you could buy. But he's really not as known as he should be, and it makes me crazy because he's really a fascinating man who did some amazing things and deserves to be as well known as Thomas Jefferson. He eventually moved back to Italy. He was too um, ill to be able to come back to the States and Jefferson had to maintain his uh, plantation before he died and then sell it. Um, and his wife is buried in the Monticello graveyard. So that's how close their families were. So to me, he's a pretty amazing guy and we should know more about him. 
So I'm going to give you a little bit of a chapter about he and Jefferson working together in the way that they did, right? So this is from chapter 11. In the absence of Jefferson, many uneducated local small farmers, laborers, and shopkeepers, those kinds of men came to Filippo for advice on business or politics. He humbly thanked them for their compliments and he learned that even if Jefferson had been in residence, Filippo's international experience was what drew these men to talk to him. Having this moment of influence, Filippo could not help using it for purposes above and beyond urging these men to support the fight for political freedom. Now is the time to talk honestly about the emancipation of the slave, he began many of his meetings with that phrase both large and small group meetings. Gradual manumission has become the way of the northern colonies, and we must follow it here. Usually smaller farmers, those who had never had time or money to rely largely on enslaved labor, were amenable to the idea of gradual manumission. The larger planters, the guys didn't want to hear about it quite so much. But the more that Filippo had a chance to bring up abolition, the more he did. Even James Madison began to talk of the right time to free his slaves. I never knew a planter to survive without slave labor, Madison admitted, until I met you. I will admit in all fairness, began Filippo, that vineyards and fruit trees require less manual labor than tobacco or wheat production. But even should I have chosen those products, and I do grow corn on my plantation very well, I would have found ways to pay my workers. Indentured servants always work harder, for the reward is something they can see in their future. I agree with you, James Monroe said. He'd come by for a little wine this evening, and he wanted to talk about some correspondence with Congress. But my father reminded me that slavery's in the Bible, so it's a good thing. <laughs> I heard that myself, said Filippo. But um, who's the hero of the Old Testament? Um, Moses, I, I would say, said Madison, thoughtfully. <clears throat> and what did Moses do that made him a hero? Freed the slaves, <clears throat> said Monroe <laughs> with a kitchen soap. <laughs> These kinds of conversations with many local men over the next few months are what involved Filippo. And he was indeed the man named Furioso who wrote essays for the local Virginia Gazette. That was something that brought him to then give speeches in the local area with a focus on this emancipation and on religious freedom, something very important to him as a Catholic. On one such Sunday, he could sense the crowd swaying to his side as he took a page out of Patrick Henry's performance and he thundered, we will be the first country to demonstrate both the justice of religious freedom and the benefits derived from it. After these moments, any congregants told Filippo he ought to have considered a life in the church. He was quite good behind the pulpit. But instead, he joined the militia, along with his friend James Madison. In early May, a delegation of Presbyterians came to Cole to ask Filippo to stand for election in the Fifth Virginia Convention at Williamsburg. They knew he was a Catholic, they were a little worried about that, but they thought what he had to say was important enough to invite him along. In his modesty, Filippo's first response was to beg off. Oh, there's no lack of other men in the county to serve as well as I. You must ask one of them first, please. This is too much of a compliment for me. Ha! Your modesty becomes a man of your station, said his friend Henderson. After Thomas Jefferson, you are the best leader in this county. You're educated while many men are not. You've lived in England and you know the English mind, and we do not. That is an important tool for us. Of course, said one of the other men in the room very quietly, the very fact that you uh, hmm, know the English might stand against you. They're not quite our friends these days. Hmm. True. But I don't believe I will be as useful there unless you allow me to speak on abolition. <clears throat> I don't want to talk about that anymore, said James Madison. Fine, said Filippo. Let's talk about freedom of religion. That is something that means something to me as a Catholic. And many men in my family are priests, including my brother, as you know. Filippo wasn't sure he wanted to deal with these men any longer. I don't believe any government can police the hearts or minds of men. My time in England showed me the foolishness of Henry VIII and how his want of a divorce destroyed the peace of an entire nation for many generations to come. Therefore, religious freedom is the only possible solution in any real country. Hmm, hmm, 
Filippo thought about the fact that he should join this group, and then thought, I'm more useful publishing than I am making speeches. So he spent his nights entertaining dinner debates with all the landowners in the area. And he would write back and forth with Thomas Jefferson, who had gone to the Continental Congress and was in the midst of writing a very important document. Now the real work of government begins, he wrote to Jefferson. Put down on paper what we stand for and how we will maintain those ideals whilst you're surrounded by other men not quite so committed to those ideals. And perhaps you will change some minds. That's the work of your committee. Jefferson reported much clashing going on in the Continental Congress, where he, Franklin, and John Adams were among the loudest to call for independence. Wanting Virginia to be represented strongly in whatever decision were to be made, Jefferson asked Filippo to send him copies of the various documents that they were being prepared at the local Virginia convention. And Filippo sent along the new Virginia Constitution, which included the phrase, all men are created equal in Virginia. Just saying. Our mother country has no belief that what they call this little insurrection will succeed, Filippo said to his friend Madison another day. I think right now they're afraid that they will not be able to crush us because our motivation is so strong. We might actually win this thing if we give people a reason to fight. And abolition might be that reason! To which Madison said, can we please talk about something else? Please? Fine. Filippo learned, according to letters from Jefferson and Adams and Franklin, that the three of them had been tasked with creating a document that would explain to the powers of Europe the principal importance of this new land. And Jefferson had been assigned to write it. So together they wrote back and forth with ideas about what should be in this document that gave the principles of the United States. Filippo sent Jefferson the Declaration of Rights that he had worked on, and Jefferson sent back some drafts that they could exchange. Finally, they felt that they had regained the friendship they'd had across many a night over wine at Monticello. And they were excited about the tumultuous new world they were creating, though they weren't sure either would survive its creation. find out more about it. It'd be lovely if you bought the book. There's lots of information about him. And we should include him in our American history classes. His name should be right up there with Thomas Jefferson. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> we now continue with a, a soldier, diplomat, archaeologist, the bold life of Louis Palmer uh, de Cisnola by uh, Peg uh, Lanfier. Dr. Lanfier has a PhD in American history and teaches interdisciplinary humanities at California State Polytechnic uh, University of Pomona. Uh, she uh, writes both nonfiction and fiction, including Kate Chase and William Sprague, Politics and Gender in a Civil War uh, Marriage, and Spur Up Your Pegasus, Family Letters of uh, uh, Salmon, Kate, and Nettie Chase, 1844-1873. Together with uh, Rosanne Welch, she edited uh, the already mentioned award-winning Women in American History. Peg also writes uh, novels set in the Civil War, including The Lincoln Special, uh, The Great Show, and uh, Rebel Bells, as well as uh, a gas lamp fantasy novel, Violent Delights and Vampires. Okay, please welcome. Thank the goddess for extra credit. I assume that's why you're here, right? Let's <laughs> be honest, right? Um, um, I'm just glad you're here. I, had, I slept beautifully from midnight to 3 o'clock last night, and then I spent the rest of the night worrying I would be talking to an empty room. So, I know, sad! Oh, is it sad when old ladies are sad? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to talk to you tonight. Stand still, Peg. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about uh, uh, Louis uh, Palma de Cisnola. He, this guy had a really fabulous, we should all have lives half so interesting. Uh, as a teenager, he fought in the first war of Italian independence. Um, then he came back to his home, got himself in a little bit of trouble, uh, went off uh, to school, 
went and fought in the Crimean War. One of his best friends was one of the guys who, uh, one of the British hussars who went to the, uh, the charge of the Light Brigade and survived it, and it ended up in the Civil War with Louis. He immigrated to the United States in 1860, uh, uh, founded the New York Fourth Cavalry in 62, fought in the war for three years, won a Medal of Honor, uh, was a consulate at um, Cyprus for a number of years, came back to New York City with a huge collection of ar archaeological stuff that he had discovered. 19th century archaeology was a pretty dirty business. And um, um, was a the first director and a co-founder of the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art. So, dude. Right? Uh, I thought there's no way you can do all that in 20 minutes and not want to kill yourself. So, um, <laughs> I mean you, not me. Um, I can talk pretty fast. I'm a professor. Um, but um, So I decided to concentrate on his experience in Libby Prison. Um, so I've found over the years that people are interested in Civil War, prisoner of war stories, and of course there's all these horror stories about the, the prisons in the Civil War, so there we have it. It's worth saying, uh, as we begin, that Louis was significantly better trained cavalryman than most of the Union officers he served with, um, and he always felt a little resentful and underappreciated because he, 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 he never made the jump from colonel to brig general, uh, in part probably, to be honest, because he was Catholic and Italian immigrant. Um, but unlike most of the Union cavalry officers who were just like dudes whose parents had enough money to have a horse that they could go riding on, um, this guy went to a really famous cavalry school in Pinerolo, um, and where this is one of the sort of the famous things they teach you to do. The, the key, I know, wow. Um, there's not enough wine in the world. <laughs> I was just imagining me drunk on a horse like that. <laughs> a little thrill. Uh, um, I mean, the key to the Pinarello riding school is to ride in a naturalistic manner because the classic way in which cavalry men were trained to ride was in a very upright, stiff, military sort of you know thing. And that's not a very good way to actually win battles. You need to be able to really ride. And so Pinarello did that for him. So, uh, in 62, uh, he, uh, he couldn't get a, 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 a cavalry unit to take him, and so he got together a whole bunch of immigrant dudes from all over Europe that had come to New York, and he put them all together into the New York 4th Cav, um, and then offered his services to the Union Army. And the Union wasn't as good at cavalry as the Confederacy was. Uh, but but everybody recognized cavalry used to be like shock troops. Like you need shock and awe. Well, imagine you're a foot soldier standing there, right? You're Denzel and Glory. And there you are, <laughs> and some dude comes running at you with this big thundering horse, and the horse is heaving and its nose is flaring, and there's a sword waving in the air. You'd pee your pants and run, <laughs> right? Um, or I would. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so they were they were always they were the kind of guys that were sent in first, sent in to scare the bejesus out of people. Um, they were sent into a, a, a civil a civil war was a war with modern uh, 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 armaments and 19th century tactics. So cavalry guys were sh shot out of their horses at high numbers because you don't want to be in a in a in a in a war with people with guns and you've got a sword. <laughs> Anyway, uh, they were part of the Gettysburg campaign. They were on the way to Gettysburg, or on the way to Pennsylvania at least. They didn't know they were going to Gettysburg, trying to cut off Lee as Lee swung up around Pennsylvania, working, trying to figure out how to get to Washington. Um, they ran into at Aldi, the Battle of Aldi, which is uh, one of the ba many battles that happens in the campaign before you get to Gettysburg. Um, they, 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 the idea was to, to, to stop the Confederate Army there at, at the farm outside of the, uh, Aldi. Uh, Louis got himself in some trouble with his commanding officer. This was a guy who was on record as saying that he didn't think immigrants should be in the Army. If they were, they should be foot soldiers, not the fancy cavalry dudes. Um, the, uh, Louis, uh, 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 lieutenant colonel, so like the guy right under him, uh, was killed, and Louis wanted his friend Parnell, the guy who'd been um, in the Crimea with him to be his second in command. And the general said no, because Parnell was Irish. Like, there's, if there's anything worse than the Italians, it's the Irish. 
<laughs> um, so they got some other guy, and Louis was like, oh, up in arms and being Louis, and, and the general, uh, Greg, took Louis' sword away from him, which is the equivalent of stripping him, like, dude, you're in huge trouble. Now go back to your tent and stay there, because there's going to be spankings later and not the fun kind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> More visuals. Um, so Louis is in his tent and he's furious. And we know because he wrote about this later. And um, 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 it, the, se the second lieutenant that he didn't want, the, I mean, the lieutenant currently didn't want, uh, leads the fourth cab out and is shot and killed. And they come back and they're like, we're not going out again. We, we ride with Louis because Louis doesn't get shot. And, and so Parnell comes to his tent and says, dude, we got it. you've got to come with us. And he says, well, I'm confined to my tent. And he says, you can come. And so Louis says, fine. And of course, he doesn't have his sword, and he doesn't have his carbine, which is an antiquated, not very good rifle. Um, he doesn't have anything, but he hops on his horse red, and he rides. He takes these guys into battle. Well, there's another cavalry general. He sees Louis in the fourth charge into battle, and he's like, wait, that guy doesn't have any weapons. Is he a lunatic? <laughs> so they, they come back and it gets called into Kilpatrick's and Kilpatrick says, dude, you're so cool, essentially, and gives him his sword and sends Louis back out. So they make four charges on the hill and the last one they take the hill, but in a sort of, sort of Hollywood kind of manner, uh, uh, Louis, uh, somebody swords him in the head uh, and, and at the same moment, Red is shot in the chest and, 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 and Red falls on Louis, a big horse falls on him, uh, and then somebody shoots Louis in the arm, and now he's laying on the ground, he's unconscious, and there's a dead horse on him. Uh, when he comes to, at dawn, the Confederates have captured him. Shoot, don't you hate it? Um, it's pretty gross. So this is actually uh, the, the, the wording from the Medal of Honor. He did get later, after the war, the um, U.S. Army uh, awarded him the Medal of Honor, which is America's highest military citation for bravery. Um, wounded in the head and the arm. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's not cool to be shot and stabbed in the head, but um, anyway. He was taken, along with a lot of other people, to Libby Prison. The Confederates, like the Union Army, didn't expect the war to go on that long and to have that many prisoners. So they were converting old tobacco warehouses into prisons. Libby Prison is perhaps the most notorious and famous of the prisons. It's the one you may have heard about the Civil War during the very first battle of Bull Run. Um, Washington uh, uh, sightseers went out to see the battle, kind of like it was a football game. And then some, some congressional dudes, who probably weren't the sharpest knives in the drawer, were like, oh, let's go get, let's get closer! And then they got captured, and they ended up in Libby. <laughs> Dudes. Um, it, was a, it was, in spite of the, the he, he is not fine, um, a really horrible place to be kept. Uh, the Confederate uh, government, very quickly in the war, like a year in, started having trouble feeding and clothing their soldiers, let alone their prisoners. Um, there were two floors. It was mostly officers. Uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Libby prison, so the conditions were better than some of the other prisons, but still bad. Um, mortality rates up 5% every year, so 15%, 25%. You can see a sort of the attrition as you couldn't feed men, they were more and more inclined to be sick. And, 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 the, and the prison would get more crowded every year as well. 10% of the men sick at any time. Eventually they closed the prison. To be fair, in 64, um, Grant was getting awfully close to Richmond, and they didn't want him to find all these Union soldiers in the prison if Grant took. A lot of what we know about Libby uh, is taken from uh, this book, Life, Libby Life, which is written by Fernando Cavada, uh, who, Frederico Fernando Cavada, uh, who is actually a, a Cuban-Italian guy, and in like the coolest thing in the war, like, I, somebody, this is so cool, the balloon cores, like those wagons would make hot air, and then they pump it into these balloon cores, and they'd go up and they'd use it to sort of see what the enemy was doing. And of course, the enemy would shoot at these balloons, and they'd come crashing down. And that's how Cavada ended up um, um, in the prison. Um, the Libby prison was visited very often by Elizabeth Van Loo, who's one of the most 
famous female spy. She was a confeder a Southern lady, not a Confederate, because she pretended to be a Confederate, but was really pro-Union. She hated slavery. She had secretly freed all of her slaves. She would visit Libby Prison and carry messages for the Union soldiers, um, and bring them food, um, and also sneak out information. When there was a huge Libby Prison break, we'll see in a second, and, and she knew they were going and gave a bunch of those men directions to her house and they broke out, snuck to her house, she hid them and then got them out. So she's a pretty cool lady. Um, uh, midway through his 10 month uh, uh, internment in Libby Prison, Luis Osnoli got a cool job. He got the job as the Commissioner of Distribution for Relief Supplies. The U.S. Sanitary Commission was a combination government do-gooder organization, so people would donate goods and the U.S. Sanitary Commission would get them to, uh, to these Confederate prisons and then hand them out to prisoners knowing that these people didn't have shoes, blankets, pants sometimes, and food. Um, and the idea was that Louis and two other officers from Libby were in charge of going out to Bell Island, which was a prison camp that was just, it was an island in the James River, so there's no fence. There's no buildings. There was my understanding from the research is there were no tents. Um, there was one building for the commanding officers and, and, and their quarters, and then you just dumped all these guys out there in the open. And Virginia gets cold. It's not Montana cold, but it's not you know Bahama Beach either. It gets cold there, and these men are just dumped out there, enlisted men. The mortality rates and the conditions on Bell Island are equal. Uh, the, the more notorious Andersonville prison. So yeah, it's really gross. Um, here, this, oh, okay, okay. there's some stats. 54 acre island in the river. A lot of people there um, at any one time and a lot of people went through there and, and, and Anderson level mortality rates. So remember the, and the mortality rates at Libby were 15, 20 and then eventually 25. They ran like 30% a lot, you guys. It's like a third of you. If you're there, you're dead tomorrow. That's it. I can't even look. You can look. I can't look. Um, if you put in if you put in Bell Island Prison and then click images at Google, you get a lot of pictures like this. Uh, physicians said that these people, these guys, were essentially imbeciles, and it was it was a product of starvation. That if you don't get enough food, first your body will eat your muscles, and you'll get that 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 Dachau look, and um, and then your body will, will chew up your gray matter in your brain because it, well, the, the most important thing it's going to do is keep your heart beating. Um, so it, it, and a lot of guys, you don't recover from that. Once your body eats up your gray cells, they're gone. The shoe rebellion, which I'm gonna read about, but I'm not gonna tell you, but there's a tiny shoe rebellion. I mean, you know, the smallest rebellion ever, but um, anyway. So, the, and then I'm gonna, in the reading, I'm gonna talk about the Libby prison break. I just love, like, drawings with, the, you know, like, architectural drawings, and look, there's a, you can tunnel, and look, there's little guys in the tunnel. What a great drawing. <laughs> um, 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 but they were allowed to roam around the building during the day, because they didn't have enough guards to sort of keep these guys. And so they figured out early on that there was some loose stones in the foundation, and that they could dig their way out, so they used to go down there during the day. And it was a little like Shawshank Rebellion, where they dig out a little, and then they'd put it in their pants pockets, and they'd go up, and they'd sort of just spread it around. They weren't allowed outside, but they could just spread it around the building, and then later in the day, they'd sweep it up and move it out. And it took a number of months before they built this tunnel over to uh, this other building is the building that they actually kept the supplies from the U.S. Sanitary Commission that Louis was taking to Bell Island to give to the poor men there. So they got into there and then escaped from there. Um, 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 120, about 120 got out. Some people say 100, but the number I see more often is 120. Um, and about half of them were caught, because that's a pretty hard thing to do. Um, Louis was paroled after 10 months. Uh, they, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, had a friend who was in a Union prison camp. He wanted his friend back, so they traded. Louis was the ranking officer in the prison as a colonel, so they trained the colonel for Jefferson Davis's friend. Louis got out. He wrote up. A, there's this a really great, like six page, six page uh, discussion of his experience in Libby. So it's fabulous from a writer's point of view because you don't get better primary sources than that. Um, he could have at that point just said, I'm done with the Army, and the Army would have been glad to let him go, because 10 months in Libya, he was in really bad shape when he got out. Um, he, uh, uh, he loitered around the house, April 
um, in May and in June he went back to the war. He and the fourth were out uh, fighting for the summer of 64, so that last, the last summer season, and then you go into the winter and that's, wars are like baseball, they're not fought in the winter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the time the war comes back in the spring, one, it's nearly done because the war's over in April, right? There's the 13th Amendment's passed, the war is done, Lincoln goes to the theater and he shouldn't have. Um, <laughs> I can't take anything too seriously. Um, but anyway, I think, that's, I think that's astounding to have been through all that and then to go back and to continue to fight. So he was out, and he had about 10 months before the war was over, and he had probably what we call now PTSD, but they didn't have a word for it then. They have words for it in, in World War One and Two, but in the Civil War, they just don't even have a category for it. Um, but he was really at odds until the war ended, and, and, and they decided to send him off to Cyprus. And the second he had a job, and he could go off to Cyprus and be the council, and then start digging for antiquities, he kind of heal himself, as many of us do by just keeping yourself busy. I'm, I'm a, I come from immigrant people, yet I'm a big believer in work, hard work solves almost all problems, right? Work hard, be nice, don't cheat, <laughs> right? That, I, that's, Louis believed in those things too. So, um, I found myself way more impressed with this guy than I expected to be, because all the sources made him sound a bit like a pill. It sounds like he was a bit of a hothead and he was passionate, but I also I think a lot of the sources were really, really um, 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 affected by the fact that he was an Italian American and they were anti that. So um, I thought he was pretty cool. I still do. I still really like him. <gasps> to the end, little harsh joke. <laughs> Very little harsh joke. Roseanne printed out for me an old lady sized font. It was fabulous. And then this afternoon at 2 o'clock, I changed my mind. It's a woman's prerogative. So I've got to read, uh, I'll read, I'm reading out of the book. So let me polish up the glasses so I can see, see how I do here. Oh, but I have the big old, I have the old lady glasses. Yeah, so sexy. <laughs> All right. At the end of November, food rations at Bell Island were again reduced. Each company of men got one bucket of boiled potatoes and cornbread to be shared amongst a hundred men. Of course, this wasn't enough to go around. Pneumonia, brought on by the starvation and cold, spread like wildfire through the camp. Louis tried to talk to Lieutenant Boisseau about the conditions, but the lieutenant was power to, powerless to do anything about it, or so he claimed. Louis started to not believe anything that came out of a man in Confederate Gray's mouth. Plundering compounded their problem at Bell Island. The Sanitary Commission stores were kept at a warehouse next to Libby where they were, at least theoretically, under guard. But each morning, Louis, Boyd, and Von Schrader would visit the warehouse and find boxes missing. Some mornings, they found ragged rebel uniforms stuffed in corners, clearly left by men who broke in and re-outfitted themselves in donated clothing. Louis complained to Captain Turner about the thefts, but Turner wouldn't even admit there was a problem, let alone do anything about it. Each day, the three of them returned to Bell Island entirely down, returned from Bell Island entirely downhearted and exhausted. Though food was becoming scarce at Libby, um, it was not as scarce as it was on the island. Where more, more, the better at free talk. Morley and Parnell managed to save Louis a morsel or two most days. They also kept him updated on the prisoner's basement project, which was making, they said, pretty good progress. Miss mm -hmm. Van Loo continued to visit, though she too was having a harder time finding enough food to share. Apparently everyone in Richmond was suffering that winter, not just the Union prisoners. Christmas was a grim day, made only slightly better by the prisoners' attempts to cheer themselves up with carols and tales of home. Mostly they told stories of dinners they'd eaten, and they talked about their favorite food and who cooked it, their mothers, their daughters, their wives. Louis missed these meager festivities. Instead, he spent the day on a little makeshift bed Morley rigged for him in the corner. Christmas morning, he woke up with a fever sweats, and by evening, he was having trouble breathing. Morley thought Louis caught a cold from the men at Bell Island, or maybe pneumonia. 
Scurvy, the scourge of all the prisoners, exacerbated his illness. He'd been weak and achy all through December, like most of the men who'd been kept for months on a diet of corn and beans. Louis Scurvy was compounded by the fact that he never ate lunch at Belle Island, and often when he got back to Libby, he'd miss dinner. Both Mar Morley and Parnell did what they could to save him food, but it was never enough. Louis was not, to su not surprised he had fallen really sick. Instead, he wondered how any of them were alive at all. It took Louis two weeks to recover from whatever he ailed him, or at least recovered enough to go back to work. He'd cough up great gobs of green goo every day, but he kept to his feet and that was good enough. When Louis returned to Belle Island after his enforced sick leave, he found that someone in charge had decided that he, Boyd, and Von Schrader could do more than make lists. They could just distribute more supplies. This made their job somewhat less awful. There was little more gratifying than giving a freezing man a blanket or a scrap to eat. In spite of the pilfering back at Libby, there seemed to be a near inexhaustible supply of crates from the Sanitary Commission and the ladies in the North. One cold and miserable day, a group of five Confederate officers, one colonel, one major, and three lieutenants showed up in the yard with a pile of handbills. The lieutenants handed them out while the other two officers stood around consul consulting with the camp commander. Louis took one of the bills and read it. They were offering 400 prisoners the chance to be paroled from Belle Island. All they had to do was work in a shoe factory making boots for the Confederates. Louis waited until the Confederate officers left and Boiseau was gone, and then he called the men in the yard together. Listen, this sounds like a good deal, but it's treason. Every boot you make, you put a soldier in the field, and that soldier kills one of us, or more. Every boot costs Union lives, and if that doesn't convince you, you can bet the Army will court-martial anyone who works for the Rebs. You'll be paroled and free for a day, yeah, sure, and you'll get a couple of meals, but then you'll be arrested and thrown in a Union prison. Spread the word. Tell them no one volunteers. But we'll die here, sir! Louis looked across at the ragged, emaciated man who'd spoken. There are worse things than dying an honorable death, son. The men nodded in agreement. Louis turned away to find Lieutenant Boisseau standing behind him. The Frenchman was red in the face with fury. I have to report this, you know. I'll lose the, you'll lose your position and you'll die in Libby prison. Louis summed up a fat glob of green phlegm and spat it at the lieutenant's feet. There are worse things than dying an honorable death, son. He did lose his Belle Island job the next day, but he heard through the prison grapevine that when the Confederate officers returned to Belle Island, they could find not one Union volunteer for their shoes for amnesty deal. By the time the tunnel was finished, Louis couldn't stand. He'd been weakened by his Belle Island work and even smaller food portions at pneumonia, and his pneumonia came raging back. He burned white hot, then freezing cold. It reminded him of that time he had typhoid in the Crimea. His chest felt like it had an anvil on it, and his exhalation sounded like he had a tiny steam train in his chest. They came to him in the middle of the night, both Morley and Parnell. It's time, Louis, Morley whispered. Louis had already made up his mind. He thought about it hard, and he couldn't do it. He couldn't endanger the men. Or if he was honest, to hell with the men. It was Morley and Parnell he cared about. They were the ones he, were, he was friends with. If he let them, they'd sacrifice themselves for him, but he wasn't going to let them. He shook his head back slowly, rubbing his head against his boots, which he'd taken to using as a pillow. Yes, Parnell whispered. There's two of us, one of you. We can get you out. Can't crawl that far, Louis whispered back. He wasn't giving up his chance of freedom lightly. There was no way he'd make it down the tunnel. The men had reported it was a good 60 feet long and barely barely wide enough for one man. He'd collapse and he'd plug up the tunnel like a cork in a bottle. You can do this, Colonel! Louis could hear the desperation in Parnell's voice. Morally, the more practical of the two spoke up. He's right, and you know it, Parnell. Parnell spoke into the silence. Then, I guess we'll stay. If we leave him, he'll die. Louis shook his head again. Go. Tell. Lou looked hard at his men. He could see it in their faces. They wanted to go, but they felt guilty about the wanting. He mustered his strength. I'll order you to go. After they left Louis, he laid in the dark, tears streaming down his face, soaking into his boots. It was a long while before he remembered to pray.
for here. We have a few minutes for questions. <laughs> Thank you for both of your presentations. Uh, Thank you for having us. Whenever we think about Italian Americans, we have very vividly in our mind uh, icons of uh, pop culture from, from the media, uh, more modern, of course, you know, John Travolta, and then we think about uh, many of the figures. Uh, who, uh, Sylvester Stallone. Sylvester Stallone, mm. of course. And, and, uh, and so it's really interesting to, uh, to have this time this evening. Uh, you're bringing some fresh air uh, to us by um, telling a very little known story huh? uh, that's much more real and less filtered by uh, imagination uh, created by uh, the media. So I, it's a very precious uh, um, piece of uh, reality that you're bringing. Huh? And I would like to invite questions from, uh, from the audience. Uh, mm -hmm. okay. This is always, this is always the hard part, isn't it? <laughs> See, that's where you have to offer the extra credit. Yeah, over the question. Uh, yeah, I have one for both of you. How um, did you come to find these men and what called you to tell their stories? Good question. Well, of course, we have to thank Robert for that. Robert yeah, I think it's mostly list. Ro it was Robert's list. And, and he, he had a list, and we were freelance writers, and he's kind of like, what interests you? And as I said briefly earlier, I love the American Revolution. I teach American history. I used to show 1776, which you probably saw in high school. And look, how come he wasn't in that movie? I don't understand. There could be this man that was part of this thing, and I've been to Monticello and done all this. I'm from Ohio, and I go, you know, all that. So it fascinated me. And then when I found out there was a nun in um, Connecticut who had saved a bunch of letters and she published some things that, that Mazet had written and whatnot. And I thought, no one's paid attention to her work in like 50 years. Why hasn't so he was immediately the one that I went to? Well, I just saw a civil war guy on the list and I was like, oh, I'm on that. Because I'm a, my, um, my, my non-historical, my historical work, my non-fictional work, uh, I, I do sort of the nexus of politics and gender, and I have an odd specialty in Salmon P. Chase, who was Lincoln's Secretary of Treasury, so, you know, that's pretty odd. Um, <laughs> and so, but I always, the thing is, you'd go to these Civil War conferences, and there'd be the, there'd be the, you know, the dudes that were doing the military history, and, and I thought, I, 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 that would be kind of fun, and so I, I both wanted to write Louis because he was a Civil War guy, and, and because I, I was super excited. One of the things fiction allows you to do, if this had been a non-fiction book, I couldn't. I, the thing I was going to read today was a battle, and there's like, there's wavings, there's, there's swords, and there's, there's dirt, and there's mud, and there's blood, and there's attacking, and that stuff was, it's, it's, it's really fun to write. It's way more fun to write than kissing scenes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Other questions? Yes? So I actually had a question about the type of sources that you use for your novels. Of course, because you're a librarian. <laughs> <laughs> and it's important that these sources exist. Um, that's a wonderful question. It was great because um, in Mazet's case, there were only these letters, and then the little itty bits of pieces where he appeared in other people's books little bits from Madison Monroe and all of that sort of thing. So there was a chance to make up a certain amount of personal. I mean, we knew his family and his wives and things like that, but what did he feel about those things and all that stuff? So it was really interesting because whenever you write about historical people, the truth is they're no different than the rest of us, right? If they got dumped by a girl, they feel bad. If something happened to their child, they feel bad. So you realize that you have a lot more in common with them than you would have assumed in the first place. So all that stuff has to be made up, especially in historical fiction. Um, but there were so many, in, in my case, Mizet had written so many letters about his life and what he was doing and what he was planning and what he hoped for that I had a chance to use a lot of language that came directly from him. So mostly it was his own work. Other people had not covered him. So these letters were in libraries? They, they were, yes, uh, a couple in Virginia. I had to get interlibrary loan, a lovely thing, right? Because they weren't in California. But um, yes, I could get them. They had been published but untouched for years by anybody in that case. And how much fun is that? <laughs> it's, yeah, you know your history geek when you get really excited about like some primary sources or some letters and you get an email from the interlibrary loan and you're like, oh, yay, it's exciting. It's exciting. 
Um, 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 I used, there was virtually, Louis left um, that, that, that article about his experience in Libby prison, and then he wrote a book about the archaeology that he did. Um, so I had a lot of primary source from him. What I had to do with the Civil War and the Crimea and the First War of Independence, well, well first I had to learn something about them, because I'm an American historian, and I was like, I'm not sure I know where the Crimea is. <laughs> um, and, but, but the great thing about soldiers is they write letters, and people keep them. And there were lots of archives, and the Civil War has got an embarrassment of riches of primary sources because everybody saved everything. So while I didn't have any letters from Louis about his cavalry experiences in the Civil War, there were lots of cavalry letters, uh, lots of sources, and then you could just email, you know, the the the. The reenactors and say, could you describe, you know, like what's a carbine feel in like in your hand? Because that's the kind of thing a letter won't get you. And the great thing about the Civil War, there's a whole bunch of super dorky guys out there who know <laughs> way too much about stuff like cannons and, and swords and, and carbines and that stuff. So that's really cool. You can get the uniforms right and the buttons right. really, really interesting story, and one of the reasons I was prepared to dislike him is um, he made a lot of, I was, he was, he made a lot of enemies in, in, as an archaeologist, and he made a lot of enemies in New York and when he got to the museum. He, he was assigned uh, the job as the council to Cyprus, so not, not an ambassador level post, because Cyprus was too small to have an ambassador, but the next thing. So he goes off and he's hanging out with the diplomatic corps there, there wasn't a whole lot to do. So he'd heard, you know, there was this cool site with antiquities and that cool site. And this was a thing guys were doing, uh, American and English guys. I mean, you know, um, 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 Downton Abbey and that big, the, you know, the Abbey? Yeah. That's, that's a, the, 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 the guy that's in Egypt doing all the King Tut excavating and stuff. That lord, that's, that's that guy. Um, it was a thing that sort of well-heeled dudes did, and you went off, and it was essentially archaeological rape and plunder. I mean, you dug stuff up, and you hauled it out of there, and you took it away from the people it was from, and you left a mess behind. But that was the way they did it. Um, so it seems super unfair that people were complaining about the way Louis did it when he was doing it just like really all the rest of them. Um, there was even some ladies engaged in archaeology, and I had a whole, I went down a little research rabbit hole with 19th century lady archaeologists, and then I think there's like two paragraphs in the book, but that happens. Well, this takes me to a question that I had uh, for both of you, uh, because often when we study history, we might you know, dislike uh, characters because of the world they lived in, and the values and sensibilities that govern those societies. Uh, yet, uh, we also have this project, the Mentoris project, that brings historical figures uh, out uh, with, the, with the goal of providing mentorship. And so, my question is, um, these two uh, individuals, what, what are the important lessons that you found in their lives that you think are still valuable uh, today, in spite of all the contradictions uh, um, that they participated in because of the times? I think for Louis, it is it is the value of never quitting in the face of immense criticism. That everything he he was he 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 had to push back on everything he wanted to do. I mean, he wanted he came here and he wanted to fight in the Civil War, and they were like, "We don't want you." And so he started his own cavalry regiment, and 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 he he. He pushed back. He never ever said, I accept your valuation of me as inferior, as an immigrant, as a, an Italian, as, an, as, a, as a Catholic. I think there's, you know, and in, in this day and age, there's an immense message to be made. Because a whole bunch of us belong to groups that are told we're not good enough, or not real enough, or not whatever the thing is. And the people that tell you that are full of it. Uh, for Mazze, I think what struck me was he was willing to stand up for principles that he believed in, even in the face of friends who firmly believed something else, when it would be easy to capitulate and say, no, you're right. 
I, I was worried in the beginning because he was a southern plantation owner, so I assumed lots of slaves because that's what was there. So I kept looking around and looking around, and again, based on what he grew, and that he came from Italy, so he brought these indentured servants, and that was the way he understood labor to work. And those men who came with him became, they got promoted and promoted and did bigger work during the war when uh, Jefferson was away. Some of them watched Monticello for him and managed his entire plantings and all that sort of work. And they eventually formed the Italian-American community of Virginia. And so their descendants still live there, many of them, and it's a very well-known thing that they all came from, you know, immigrated with Mazai to run his, his plant. So, First I thought, oh, he's going to be that guy, and I'm going to have to find a way around the fact that he had slaves, and that really sucks. Um, and then I found out he didn't. And I was like, this is way more impressive. I don't have to make an apology. I can think about it. But it's also that he did love friends, and he was a very loyal man. And you know, if your friends want to do something, you know it's really not exactly right. You got to like, uh, do I lose the friend, or do I do the thing, and maybe just I pretend to do the thing long enough for them to like me. Um, there's like totally off of Italian Americans for a minute, but there's a great story about President Jimmy Carter. When his father got sick, he took over the family peanut farm, and he was asked to join the KKK, because all the Georgia business guys were doing that. And he said no, and he lost two-thirds of his dad's business, because they all went someplace else. And his friend said, here's the deal, dude. Sign up for the club, but on club meeting nights, <coughs> have a cough and stay home, right? And then just get around it. And he said, I can't do that. So instead, he went and he visited all the men who stopped doing business with him and tried to explain, he was a Baptist, right, from his personal religious opinion why he couldn't be a member of such a group. And he eventually got about half of those men to come back into business with his dad again. So the idea that he was willing to risk his father's business and what he was there to do, you don't find people like that very often. So, like, Mizet was that guy for me, and I was really impressed that you could. And the men respected him more because he didn't kowtow to their opinions, and that impressed me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Um, something that was mentioned earlier um, was the women. Um, and I was wondering if uh, y'all did any interesting resource, maybe from the list that was provided, or just in your findings. I know um, one woman was mentioned, and like breaking people out and helping. Um, is there any, any other women, notable women, that interest you? I second booked this Robert gloriously. Uh, I offered and said, yeah, I can do another book. And I said, you don't have a lot of ladies on the list. And essentially said, send me some names. And I found a labor organizer named Angela Bombay's um, that was around in the early 20th century at all the sort of big labor events in New York, and I wrote the book. And they're working, it's being copy edited right now. But that was, I'm a women's historian, really. I mean, I like to write about, it was fun to write about horses and swords, but, um, <laughs> but I, I, yeah. It was, and and, and I, like, I wanted to do more with Louie's wife in the book, and I it just couldn't, I didn't know anything about her, I couldn't find anything. There was a guy who lived in a man's world doing manly things. So I didn't want to push the story to the place it wouldn't go. So you have to, when you're a writer, you have to pay attention to where the story wants to go. The story didn't want to go there. And if I couldn't push it there, then nobody could. Likewise, um, I was able to include some of the women in the world at that time, mostly the wives of all these famous men. Uh, but my second book is on General Garibaldi and in studying the Italian wars of independence, there are, I keep stumbling on, and then there was this English female journalist who was hanging around the battles writing about it, you know, so of course she's in there now. Um, there was a countess who raised money and gave it to Garibaldi, and she's, you know, so I keep finding all these women who were deeply involved, and there were three women known to have been soldiers in Garibaldi's thousand. And they were the wives of very famous men or, you know, younger men in the, in the group. And we know that in the Civil War and the American Revolution, there often are women who dress up as men to go along with their husbands or their sons sometimes Passing because they want to be with them. Exactly. So I found a bunch of those ladies. And it's lovely how Garibaldi keeps... And he actually did run into several of them in the course of all the, the research that I found. So, yes, because we're interested in that on, on our own terms, we've made sure to find as many women who come from that time period and to give as much of their real world as we can. And then, as well as the Angela book, uh, you heard them say earlier, this great book on Maria Montessori, right? So Robert's been really good about finding some women who have been covered very well. Mother Cabrini. Mother Cabrini, exactly. exactly. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, 
got me excited when you talked about Garibaldi. You, you talk about Anita, don't you? Yeah, well, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you got to see, yeah. For a minute, I was like, maybe I could just do like the love story of the two of them. No, no, no. That's no, a compelling it, story in and of itself. It's a it? beautiful story, and it's so and desperately sad. The way she dies, her last words. In her eye, exactly, in, in, in his arms, basically. So that's really that's an beautiful. Story. And, and the idea is that he was searching for unity all his life of the country, but also of his own life. And that's the, he got it for the country, and he couldn't get it for himself. Yeah. And that she died fighting for his dream because she wasn't even Italian. Right, yeah, right, it's right. really beautiful. Yeah, and she's really beautiful. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Any other questions? Yes, please. This is for both of you. Uh, out of all the history that you've ever learned, what's your favorite piece that inspires you and why? I like the Civil War spies. And that's why, like the novels I write, because it's really hard to write history books about spies because of the nature. It's it's like writing about the Underground Railroad. It's hard to write about secret things. Um, and so I decided to write. There was a Civil War. She was a there was a woman who was a Pinkerton detective. She was the first Pinkerton detective. And this was back before the Pinkertons turned evil. Um, <laughs> so. And um, 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 she was on the train with Lincoln, and 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 um, she. She prevented the first assassination attempt on him before he was even inaugurated. I love, I love the Civil War, Civil War bad girls. These women who broke the rules and did stuff that women weren't supposed to do. And indeed, were particularly good at it because I mean, women have always made good spies historically because one, we can get dudes to tell us stuff. <laughs> and we have special powers, and um, or parts. <laughs> and um, and also because because in a, in a patriarchal world we're not taken seriously, so you can, you know, you can move in places. There's a bunch of things about gender relations that make women particularly um, good spies, and it suggests that in moments of oppression, just because the culture says you're not good enough doesn't mean you aren't, and the, the world's full of people who break their rules every day. That's a uh, civil lady spies for me. That's funny. Oh, that's a huge question because there's a lot of things I love. I mean, I write a lot about female screenwriters who most people don't know. And I'm screenwriters in general. You watch movies, you can quote the dialogue. You have the time to know who wrote the movie, which I always know who directed it, which makes me crazy because the director didn't write the dialogue. So go figure out who wrote it. Um, so th that's an area that I'm very interested in. But when you think about the, the best stories in history, I have to say, the one that stuck with me forever is almost everybody in high school reads The Diary of Anne Frank, which is cool. You should read that. You should also read the memoir of Meet Geis, because she's the woman who kept them hidden. She's the woman who Mr. Frank went to in his business and said, we're going to hide in the attic here, and we need you to bring us food every week for as long as it takes, knowing that if you get caught, you'll get killed, because that's illegal. And she did it anyway. And it amazes me, there's her in her book, she, and she never told a whole bunch of people, and before she died, they got her to write a book. She would bike six to ten miles into the countryside every Saturday to scarvage food from little farms and buy blackmail food from guys and they're running out of stuff, right? And then she would bike back and deliver it to them and take care of them. And she's the reason when they were taken, she gathered all, like, Anne Frank didn't have a diary like a diary. She had a bunch of pieces of paper and they were scattered everywhere. And, and this woman, Neve Geist, collected them all up and kept them in her home until Mr. Frank came back from the concentration camp. She's the reason we have that story. And I think everybody should know her name as much as they know Anne Frank's name because we wouldn't even know Anne Frank without her. So the idea, again, of people who, who are willing to do what they need to do because they know it's right even when the world around them says it's not. I think that we could probably uh, continue the conversation uh, long into the evening, but we are nearing the, the end of uh, our program, and I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Lanfier and Dr. Welch for coming uh, and giving us a sample of their work. Uh, uh, so please, uh, let's all thank them. what the Mentoris uh, project is about. Uh, there is a table there with, uh, with copies of their books, but also you can learn about the other volumes um, available. And before we close, I do want to uh, invite Robert Barbera uh, to share some of his uh, comments. Uh, maybe there is something about the Mentoris project that we have not uh, said, and I wanted to make sure that you have an opportunity to uh, talk as well. 
I, I'm not prepared, but I'm always prepared. <laughs> it, it, it's one of those things. And, and I think uh, why this started uh, from uh, different points of value or interest of my own was that probably like yourself, you're going through school and you hear about the same people all the time. I know I was raised in New York and here we go again. You get to the seventh grade, then eighth grade, you have the same guys again, and you get into high school, and you have it over again. And um, the repetition uh, kind of said, well, could this be why we really formed this country? And uh, was it all about them? Uh, was there something else behind it? And I always thought there was a certain kind of void in that uh, even the great people that we know about we only know from an academic point of view and not a, a personal kind of view. And so it always uh, irritated me that I really wanted to know what kind of family they had, uh, what was in their background, what they even ate, uh, what was their schooling, and, and, and make them and bring them alive. And so the whole idea was uh, not to talk about the typical things that you find in a, in a history book or some kind of a class, but to, to be able to befriend people uh, that have accomplished so much. And so rather than lean to the people that uh, I typically would have expected to write about, that so much has been written about, because of my uh, second generation being Italian American, I thought, wait a minute, I know about these kind of people. No one else seems to know about them. And, and they served the purpose and they did something, they accomplished something. And uh, I thought that let's give a personal touch, and uh, this certainly was beyond my ability uh, to write uh, these books. I can't write like uh, these people by any means. And so I was lucky enough to have a manager, uh, Mrs. Richardson. I noticed that her earlier is over there. Uh, and we can't do anything without her uh, spearheading and keeping these guys busy and keeping them uh, moving. Uh, because it is a challenge, it takes an awful lot of time. And then I started out with uh, three or four people to write about, and I said, well, wait a minute, maybe there's 10. <laughs> maybe there's, you know, maybe there's 15. Maybe there's 20. I'm up to 50. And, and now I say, you know what, 50's not enough. I think we need a few more. So there's just wonderful people over the years to find out about what they accomplished. And the whole idea is they each have different genres. Some could be military, some could be inventors, some could be scientists, some could be politicians. And so I was trying to open this up uh, to just fill her library over here so that uh, we, we could see more and, and find out more. And, and it has more to do with fun. It has as much to do with inspiration. And when you bring all this together, uh, it's, it's another way. I, I'm also thinking about going into some other kinds of uh, backgrounds uh, that I'm not going to expose right now. But uh, for me, uh, to have people like these two ladies and have the uh, people that are there that can create these things and bring these people alive is my absolute joy. Uh, my pleasure is their pleasure. And I want to thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for our vision and collaboration. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us. Uh, before you leave, uh, there is a sign-up sheet uh, for Italian students uh, um, in one of the coffee tables. And have a good night. Thanks, you guys. You're great.